All right, ladies, welcome to my study and welcome to Plato's Gorgias. Uh, the Gorgias is a Socratic dialogue um, which takes place at a dinner gathering. Socrates is at this party with a group of people known as sophists. Sophists were teachers at the time um, who would have been teaching wealthy, young, uh, noble men. Um, and the, one of the key things they taught was the art of rhetoric. Now, rhetoric is the ability to manipulate um, an audience, the ability to manipulate to get what you want. It is not concerned with truth and is quite happy to use um, what we would probably, if we wanted to be blatant, call lies to get the end of the speaker. So in that way, it is not very far removed from what we're seeing in world politics today. Um, of course, Socrates is more concerned with the nature of truth. He is concerned with the forms, um, uh, that which is unchanging, eternal, universal. Um, so for him, um, rhetoric, uh, so to speak, grates. And this is, leads to, um, I suppose, it, we would call it a polite alteration, altercation, I should say, altercation between himself and some of the sophists who were there. Um, very early on, Socrates asks Gorgias if he would teach rhetoric to a pupil who didn't know what was right and wrong. In other words, would you teach someone the ability to manipulate other people um, if that person didn't know what was right or wrong? From Socrates' point of view, really, um, the politicians of the time, the, the, guiders, the, the guides of the people at that time should know what is right and what is wrong so that they can guide the um, the polis, the people, in terms of what is right and wrong. Whereas from a sophist point of view, using rhetoric, they are more likely to be quite happy to... Um, they are more interested in gaining what they want than what is right or wrong. In fact, you don't need to know what is right or wrong. You just need to know what you want. Anyway, that's, that's a very sort of simplified way of understanding. Socrates asked Gorgias if he would teach rhetoric to a pupil who didn't already know what was right and wrong. Gorgias admits that he would. Now, at this stage, that, that makes Gorgias sort of look silly in the in the the state of the conversation so at this stage another sophist comes in his name is polis he comes to gorgias's defense but then socrates gets him to agree that and the quote is doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong this is an absolute key quote, because this is the point that the entire conversation starts with. So the, the piece of text that we have for VCE starts here. It's not really, we don't actually hear from Gorgias or Polis. We take up with a, a third thinker. But it's Polis admitting that doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. So from a sophist point of view, they would rather get the people or they would rather get the people to do something that was wrong as long as it was good for them or it gain, got them what they want i'm just being really careful about the use of it was good given that the entire context of our conversation is what is good and the good life so this provides us with the framing statement uh, for our study Callicles comes to Polus's defence to argue against this idea. 
So the key idea, doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. So who's Callicles? Um, when I have taught this in the past, there is a tendency to make fun of Callicles. Uh, he comes across as a sort of pleasure-seeking sort of chap, which makes him sort of sound like he's some sort of young yeah, hipster philosopher. And he was regarded as a younger philosopher, but the reality is he would have been um, an older man. Uh, so Calicles was an ancient Greek philosopher, he was a friend of sophist Gorgias. Calicles argues, I, I, I'll let you, we, I've supplied you with this um, PowerPoint that goes with this little film, or you can pause it, and that way you can read through yourself. So I'm not planning to just read straight from each text, but I'll skim through. Calicles argues strongly, um, uh, argues that the strong should rule over the weak. Might makes right. Uh, again, a idea that we see far too often in our current politics. It was this belief that was used to support tyrants who'd come to power in Athens at the time. Um, Callicles believed that some people were naturally superior to other people and that they should use this to their advantage. Um, we'll discuss this in more detail, but it, there are certain elements um, where it's hard to deny that this is the case. Obviously, um, someone who wins the Olympic 100 meter sprint is both naturally and obviously with their training, um, faster than you and I. Uh, there's a really tricky distinction then about whether or not they're a better or a more worthy person. Um, and Callicles is going to take it that if someone is stronger, then they are more worthy in the sense that they should have what they want. Calicles denies that there is any divine basis for human laws um, because most people are weak according to Calicles, they have come together to create laws. Okay, so human laws or nomos, he feels are a way for the weak people in society to control the strong people. Come to that again, that's sort of fundamental as well. Calicles denies there's any divine basis for human laws. Because most people are weak, according to Calicles, they've come together to create laws in order to have more than they would otherwise. They then declare that justice is obedience to these laws. Um, he encourages those who are naturally superior to see through this sham and pursue their advantage. For Calicles, this would be true justice. Calicles puts forward a position that everyone should do what is in their best interest. Um, this is technically known as ethical egoism. It's probably a phrase you may have studied before. Ethical egoism. He believes that it is accomplished when everyone tries to satisfy their own desires. So if you desire something, you, you should be able to take it. That the good is found in satisfying your personal desires. Um, this is generally known as hedonism. Um, and although desires aren't always physical, um, hedonism is most often associated with the satisfaction of sort of base desires and our base appetites. And of course, our base appetites would be simply food, drink, um, and sex. So all three obviously relate to, um, in a sense, the perpetuation of both the individual and the species, or the individual's name, if you want. So you have to eat to stay alive, you have to eat and drink, you have to have sex to reproduce. Um, they're also uh, associated with the idea of pleasure, and this is usually how most people understand the term hedonism, in terms of satisfaction of pleasure. 
Those who are best able to satisfy their own desires are indeed better than everyone else. Uh, and they attain virtue and um, happiness. That's Callicles' position. And you can see uh, sort of immediately that it is, um, it contrasts with Aristotle's position. Uh, if you remember, Aristotle dismisses the life of pleasure as the good life in so much as this was not unique to man. Uh, animals feel pleasure. So a life lived purely for pleasure is effectively, for, for Aristotle, a animalistic life. Now, again, just to remind you, um, Plato is writing before Aristotle. Plato is Aristotle's teacher. Um, we've studied Aristotle first because the Nicomachean Ethics um, and Aristotle's understanding of eudaimia, the good, um, I think it gives a very sort of solid basis to look at a range of other philosophers, ironically also to look at Plato who comes before him. Okay, we'll keep going. So, Calicles begins, this is basically, this, this film is basically just an overview of the text. It is a long text because it is a dialogue and it therefore takes a long time to read. Um, it's not hard to read because being a dialogue, it's a conversation and that can make it um, sort of clear, particularly because they're labelled who, who is speaking. One of the difficulties, though, is the way Socrates works. Um, you will know or know of the Socratic method, and the Socratic method is a method of asking questions. And what Socrates tends to do is accept someone's point of view. Um, often, if he doesn't have a great deal of respect for that person, he accepts their point of view in a way that makes them feel very good about themselves and then he starts to question them until he dismantles their point of view. And this is what he does with Callicles. Um, he doesn't always do this. There's, there are other times when he's talking with other people who he respects more. Um, he will probably still follow the idea of asking them questions, but maybe not in a way that is as embarrassing, you might say, as what it ends up being with Callicles. So... Socrates accepts Callicles' point of view and then asks him, okay, that's, oh, yep, I'm stupid, I don't understand anything, you're very smart, you're very bright, well done Callicles, I completely agree with what you're saying, I never thought about it like that, just want to ask you one question. And that's how the, the dialogue goes. So Callicles begins by claiming that Socrates is simply shifting the starting point of the argument. Um, and we'll go back and just recall that the starting point for us is this phrase, doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. Okay, doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. Um, really interesting phrase that has turned up on exams again and again. Um, and you need to really take hold of it and think about it and think about what it means. Um, suffering wrong would include punishment. Um, we've talked uh, in general about suffering and the value of suffering, and we will come to the value of suffering when we look at Nietzsche. So this becomes a really interesting text to then compare with Nietzsche. Um, the role of suffering in the world. For, for Nietzsche, suffering has a value. Um, so, Callicles is saying it's worse to suffer wrong than to do wrong. It would be worse, so to really oversimplify this um, and use a sort of a very, very gross, not, not gross, awful, but gross as in simple um, example. Imagine that Callicles um, is thirsty 
and you have a drink. If Callicles is stronger, which he would believe he is, he believes he should be allowed to use his strength. So if he is thirsty, he is suffering. So from his point of view, it would be worse for him to suffer than it would be for him to steal your drink. Okay, So stealing your drink would not be wrong. Being thirsty and suffering because of it would be wrong. It would be more contemptible. Okay, let's, that's, that is the sort of starting point. Keep that in mind as we go. So back to this. Calicles begins by claiming that Socrates is simply shifting the starting point of the argument. He distinguishes between convention and nature. Convention is that which we agree upon. Nature is just how things are. He argues that laws um, are made by the weak to look after themselves. They also create the criteria for judging these, um, these praise and criticism of the praise and criticism in respect to these rules. These praise and criticism? I think that's just a typo. I'll keep going. Natural justice. In contrast to convention, Calicles says that we only have to look at nature. So this is Calicles putting forward his first argument. And his first argument is, look, Socrates, we only have to look at nature to see evidence of what is better. Okay? We only have to look at nature to find evidence that it is right for better and in this case he means stronger, to have a greater share than worse. This leads him to say that the superior person shall dominate the inferior and have more than him. He will have in mind things like, and you can think of it in, in nature, the better, the better person, the stronger person would be the lion. The weaker person would be the, the antelopes. Um... From Calicles' point of view, the lion, I know lions live in prides, but the lion hunts maybe one or two lions, or even possibly by itself, whereas the antelope exist in a herd. They, um, they come together, they have an agreement of how they look after each other um, because they are weaker. And if they do not stay together, then they will be killed by the lion. So when a lion attacks, the lion is actually usually, if you ever watched a lion attack a herd of antelope, it's always waiting for the weakest to break off from the pack, and then that's what it attacks. So this is what, um, this is what good old Callicles will be thinking about. Thank you. Um, so, this leads him to say that the superior person shall dominate the inferior and have more than him. And again, that quote there is one that you should know. The superior person shall dominate the inferior, and here's the point, and they shall have more than him. That's where a materialistic aspect of Callicles' thought comes in. Um, and it becomes evident as we go on that Callicles is really trying to put forward a justification for him and his kind, which would be the, the the rich, noble young men of the of Athens, um, having more. He's basically trying to justify the fact that they have servants, that they live in big houses, that they have more food, that they, if he wants, he can have sex whenever he wants with whoever he wants. He wants to justify a very physical hedonistic lifestyle. Um, he offers some examples of superior persons. He offers uh, Xerxes um, and Hercules. You can look them up. Um, you probably know who Hercules already was. Both of them um, very powerful and able to dominate those around them. This leads uh, to a discussion about rhetoric versus philosophy. So before they get right into the nature of what makes a good life, 
Um, it returns to um, a discussion of rhetoric versus philosophy. Actually, what happens here is Callicles starts out and says, as I just said, that Socrates, you've mixed this all up. You're trying to confuse us all. You have um, you've shifted the starting point of the argument between convention and nature. And then he says, Socrates, uh, it, nature shows us that um, from the from the point of view of nature. The superior person so dominate the inferior and have more than him. And then he gets really quite rude, and there's a long part passage which is effectively just an ad hominem or an attack on the man on Socrates. And you can kind of imagine if this, I mean, for the dramatists in the class, uh, can imagine how this might look that you've probably got a group of men, um, you've got the older men who. Gorgias and Polus, and they've been having their discussion with Socrates, and they've kind of backed off, and this young Callicles pops in, and he's like, Socrates, and he's probably looking around at his, at his friends, he's showing off, this is his chance to take on Socrates, everyone knows Socrates is, um, sort of, has this reputation of being the most intelligent person in Athens. So this is a chance for this young philosopher to really take him on. Um, and he says, says, you're wrong. I can see where you're wrong. You've, you've shifted the starting point of the argument. And then he just hits into him. Callicles proceeds to attack Socrates for practicing philosophy. Um, so here he's basically sort of saying, you practice philosophy uh, philosophy is for losers. Um, we practice rhetoric. Rhetoric is for men who want to take charge, um, who are going to be the next leaders, who are going to rule. It is achingly, I mean, we're, this is 2019, um, making this. We are watching in the news Donald Trump in America. This... Yeah. Things don't change. Anyway, lines 484 C to E are a sustained attack on Socrates. Uh, Callicles champions rhetoric. Um, Socrates practices philosophy. In this, you'll notice that at some points, Socrates also talks about philosophy um, and personifies philosophy, as if philosophy is... Uh, his lover that he must uh, obey. So, key terms here. Rhetoric appeals to popular opinion. It is corporate. It's for all people. Um, it is changing. It changes according to whatever the popular uh, opinion is. In modern politics, we see that uh, a lot of modern, modern politics bases itself not on what is right and wrong, but on the polls. P-O-L-S. P-O-L-E-S. Ah, P-O-L-L-S. Polls. Um, polls. Uh, anyway, the polls. When you go and you get um, people come out and they give you surveys and they say, do you like this? Do you like that? And if 100 people out of uh, sorry, if 90 people out of 100 people say, we like this, then the politician says, that's what I'm for. Now, in a, in a more traditional sense, um, and I am old enough to remember politicians like this, uh, there were politicians who said, we should have, for example, we should have health care for everyone because it is the right thing. It's not very popular. It's going to mean we have to raise taxes. Um, that would be raising taxes for everyone. Um, and it may be that they look at the polls and the polls say that there's a lot of people who are against it. But they say, we will do it because it is the right thing. We live in an age where most politicians go, okay, what do the polls say? If that's what people want, that's what I'm going to say I'm for. Uh, again, it, it really questions the idea of leadership. 
politicians are meant to be our leaders. They're meant to guide us and to shape our, us as a people and as a nation. Um, too often, they have little interest in being uh, a guide. They just want to maintain the job so that they get all the perks of the job. They get the power. They get the money. They get um, the ability to do what they want to satisfy their desires. And how do they get all that? Well, they keep us happy. They tell us what we want to hear. Not what is right or wrong, but what we want to hear. This sounds horrifyingly like what we're watching in American, Britain and Australian, Australian politics at the moment. So rhetoric. Appeals to popular opinion. Corporate. Changing. Temporal. Philosophy. It is concerned with truth, with forms. Universal, unchanging and eternal. Um, and Calicles is sort of rude enough to say that philosophy is, you know, it's good for a little kid. He almost treats philosophy as uh, the same way some atheists t- treat religion these days. Um, this sort of, oh, it's good to believe in uh, invisible realities when you're a little kid. But grow up. Now you're an older man, Socrates. You know, get involved in real intellectual stuff like rhetoric. And all the way through that attack, you can probably imagine Socrates just sitting there, not angry, just waiting, just sort of smiling. Like, he probably is looking, you know, doing that look that, that he does when he's going, oh, yes, you're, you're probably right. Oh, I was too stupid to really see this. Well, in his brain, he's thinking, I am going to dismantle you. Let's see how it goes. Ah, talking of modern politics, surely you can agree that truth can be created by the repetition of a lie. Oh my God, this just seems far, far too relevant at the moment. So, after that attack, Socrates goes, you were right, I was wrong, can I ask you one question? And then it begins. Socrates starts by asking Callicles to clarify what he means by better. Okay, Callicles, if you remember, Callicles said the superior, um, we only have to look to nature to find evidence that it is right for better to have a greater share than worse. This leads him to say that the superior person shall dominate the inferior and have more than him. So, Socrates says, what do you mean by better? Callicles first goes, well, it's obvious, you know, superior, uh, stronger, better. And he basically says, you know, those, that, and he treats those three terms, superior, stronger, better. He treats them as if they are synonymous. Keep in mind that Callicles is arguing that according to nature, the superior person shall dominate the inferior and have more than him. Socrates' arguments go as follow. According to nature, the general populace, the masses, is superior to an individual. They are stronger. So what you've got to follow here is, this is Socrates goes, right, okay, so we're working from nature. Um, Yes, says Callicles. Okay, and you're saying that the the stronger are the superior. Yes, says Callicles. Right, says Socrates. So, in nature, if you had, say, I don't know, a hundred people versus one person, who would be stronger if it was a fight? Um, and Callicles is forced to go, well, you know, obviously the, the hundred people would be stronger. The, the masses would be stronger. Right, says Socrates. And the masses make the laws. Yes, says Callicles. Um, which you've just said the laws are just there to help the masses um, control 
the individuals. Yes, 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 says Calicles. Right, but let me make certain I've got this, says Socrates. According to nature, the general populace is superior, i.e. they're stronger. Okay. And they're the ones that make the laws. Yes, okay. And you've said superior is synonymous with better. Yes. So therefore, the masses are better than the individual. Therefore, from the point of view of nature, not from the point of view of um, convention, what con conventional idea, but from the point of view of nature, what the masses prescribe, i.e. laws, is better. Um, and you can see, you probably see Calicles go, like take do a double take there and go, well, because he doesn't feel that the laws are better. But the argument does lead him to say that. And then Socrates continues, and the general populace rules that equal distribution of good is right and that doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. So the general populace, one of the laws that we've come up with as a general populace, who you're saying are, um, are the weaker people, but we've just recognised that they're stronger together, which makes them superior, which makes their laws better. Um, and the laws they've come up with say that equal distribution, rather than someone having more, remember that phrase, have more than him, right? Equal distribution is right. And also doing wrong, so according to the laws of the populace, um, it is worse to do wrong than it is to suffer wrong. Um, take, for example, if someone um, punches, someone beats someone else up, the general popular view is that it was worse to be the person who did the beating than it was to be the one who got beaten up. Does that make sense? It is worse to be the one who breaks the law than the one who suffers because of that. So, because the laws um, say this, and the laws come from the masses, and we've already agreed, we've got Calicles to agree that the masses are better because they're stronger. A mass is better than uh, stronger than an individual. Um, that leads to the final conclusion. Hence, it isn't only by convention that the laws and Socrates' point of view is correct. It's also by nature. So read that through again, make certain you understand it, but basically, Callicles has said that you've started the argument off from the point of view of convention, and that's wrong. We need to look at it from the point of view of nature. Socrates has said, okay, now from the point of view of nature, the masses are superior to an individual because they're stronger, naturally. They make the laws. This uh, superior is synonymous with better. This means that the laws are better. The laws say equal distribution is right and doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. Hence, it isn't only from convention that supports Socrates, but also from nature. And you can see at this point that Callicles has probably just gone... Let's go to the next page. Calicles goes, no, 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 wait, 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 that's, that's not what I meant. Um, which is a classic, um, classic technique you see with certain people in arguments when they get back before an argument, it gets shown to be wrong and they go, yeah, but I didn't mean that. Let me redefine and start again. So he does. Calicles responds by redefining what he means by better. He still says that better is synonymous with superior but he's going to avoid the word stronger now, because remember that an individual wasn't as strong as a mass. Okay, But he now rejects stronger, and instead he says, no, when, look, I didn't mean stronger. What I meant was 
Um, superior is elite. And that's a very tricky word. What, what do you mean by elite? Um, elite is actually a, a very tricky word now, day and age, because um, to a degree in Australian society, particularly, intellectual elite are looked in, are often looked down upon. It's a negative thing. Oh, you're elitist. Um, somehow you are, you know, up yourself to use a gross term. Um, you think you're better than us. And yet we're very happy, particularly in Australia, to talk of sporting elite in a, in a positive term. Oh, he's, he's the sporting elite. She's the sporting elite. She's the best at what she does. So this term elite gets used, um, used and misused, particularly in Australia, uh, to refer both to a good thing and to a bad thing. Again, it's not precise enough for us to work with here, for Socrates to work with, and he says, what do you mean by elite? And this forces Callicles to sort of redefine or to, to really sort of nail into it. And he says, I mean more clever. Now, Callicles here is thinking that he is um, rich, upper class. He thinks he's better than most other people. He will think in his mind that he's cleverer than most other people. He feels that he has an education and they didn't, so he's smarter than them. Um, there's been a lot of talk the other day, just, just recently, um, Boris Johnson became the Prime Minister in England. And there's been a lot of talk about, oh, he's very clever, he went to Oxford. Um, my wife, who also went to Oxford, says she knows a lot of people who went to Oxford who weren't very clever. They were from the right class and from the right family and had the right background. Um, but they thought they were very clever and most people would, would think they are clever because they went to Oxford. Um, and this is kind of where Callicles is coming from. He's that sort of person. What my wife would call an upper class twit. So this thing gets really interesting because Socrates goes, oh, clever. Okay, fair enough. Socrates then uses several examples to challenge the idea that a more clever person would want more than another person. If you remember, the superior person shall dominate the inferior and have more than him. That, that part of that phrase is what, um, is what Socrates is taking issue with here. And that's that part of the phrase that Callicles wants everyone to accept so that he is justified in having more than other people. So that he would be justified if he, you know, um, happily sold out all of his workers so that he could have more money. So Socrates first starts out and says, let's look at some clever people. He goes, so obviously a doctor, let's take for example a doctor. Um, or precisely a dietitian. So a dietitian is more clever at understanding food and what we should eat. Yes, says Callicles. Right, I've got it. So they're a superior person. Yes, says Callicles. They're a superior person. They're very, very clever. So they would therefore want, or they would have more than other people in their field. Um, they would have more food. Now, you, I'm certain, can all see the problem with the idea of just having, you know, if you are a dietitian, you are more clever in the field of food, therefore you should have more food, but of course having more food will lead to gross overweight um, and health problems. Wait a sec, says Socrates, I'll give you another example. What about a weaver? someone who makes coats. So obviously they are an expert, they are the elite coat maker. They are more clever than everyone else in their field of making coats. Therefore, they will have more coats. So they will wear 
hundreds of coats, in which case they're probably going to find themselves very uncomfortable, probably overheat, and probably die. Uh, again, it, it makes a mockery of this idea that just being more clever. We have to be really careful. Though. Callicles doesn't, doesn't really come back at Socrates. He doesn't say that they will have more stuff in the field that they are clever in. Um, he is trying to say that they are, um, they should have more, more power is what, and wealth is what, but he wants more power. He's really thinking, Callicles is really thinking about the fact that he should become a leading politician and have more power because he is cleverer in the field of politics, rhetoric. Um, and I'm certain Socrates appreciates the kind of silliness of his examples here. Um, and he's actually leading Callicles on to the point where Callicles is going to say, uh, A, what they need to be more clever in, and B, what that then gives them more of. Okay, so you can read through the examples as a doctor, dietitian, a weaver, uh, a coat maker, a shoemaker, and a farmer. Uh, just some pictures to sort of confirm what I was saying. That's, uh, they're looking rather different. That's um, Lawrence Fishburne and Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne and Keanu Reeves, who were both in the first Matrix film together. But Fishburne looking rather massive there because he's got about a thousand coats on, obviously taking on Calicles' idea that being an expert coat maker means that he can wear more coats. Uh, what I mean was, um, and this is... This is now Callicles backtracking again. He realizes he sounds pretty silly in what he's in the way that Socrates has presented it, so he starts to backtrack. Getting frustrated with Socrates using so many examples, Callicles attacks him, saying, Oh, you're just repeating yourself, Socrates, saying the same thing over and over again. Now, Socrates replies, Yes. And I keep saying the same things about the same issue as well. Here he's been highly sarcastic. Basically, Socrates is saying, the things that I believe in don't change. Philosophy is unchanging, eternal, universal. What I say is right, is right now, is right in the other side of the world, and will be right for all time. Um... So yes, when you accuse me of saying the same thing over and over again, I don't take that as a bad thing. Callicles isn't quite bright enough to pick that Socrates has just made fun of him. So Socrates replies, yes, and I keep saying the same things about the same issue as well. Here is referring to the consistency of philosophy in contrast to the fickle nature of rhetoric. But Callicles doesn't realise he's being mocked. Callicles then redefines his position yet again. He now claims that what he has intended all along is cleverness in politics. That's what I meant. When I said um, better, I meant cleverer. Superior, I meant cleverer. And I meant not just cleverer in coat making or dietitian or shoemaking. I meant cleverer in politics. And he adds that cleverness is only one part and a person like this needs courage. Because again, he thinks of himself as um, fairly courageous, uh, intellectual sort of person. I'm the smartest person here. I'm a very stable, smart genius and I'm the bravest person and I could fix all the world problems um, like that if I wanted to. So, Socrates, you can see Socrates going, oh, oh, I didn't get it. Thank you, you're explaining it so well. 
Um, obviously, I was stupid with everything I said before. Now I understand it. It's about being clever. It's about being clever in politics. And that would mean that you should have more power. Thank you, Callicles. Uh, you're so smart. You're so clever. Sort of really butters him up. And then he says, so Callicles has arrived at a point where he claims that the superior person is clever at politics and brave. These people should have more political power. And these rulers should have more than their subjects. At this point, Socrates appears to shift the conversation to the nature of these rulers. Ah, oh, I get it. I completely agree. Thank you for explaining. Can I just ask you about these rulers? Go for it, says Calicles. Now, Calicles, because Socrates has basically said, oh, you've won, you've won. Calicles goes, yes, yes, I have. Socrates then says, can I ask you about the nature of these rules? Of course you can. I know all about it, says Callicles. So Socrates says, are these rulers or are they subjects? By this he means, are they in control? Are they rulers or are they subject? Are they subject to something else that controls them or rules them? By ruling themselves, he means being self-disciplined and in control of oneself, mastering the pleasures and the desires which arise in oneself. So instead of just react, uh, acting upon our desires, master them according to... So if there was a chocolate bar in a mousetrap, I master my desire for the chocolate bar because I'm thinking I know that there's a mousetrap there and I'm able to master my desires and that's what makes me self-disciplined and means I don't get my finger busted by a mousetrap. So this question catches Callicles off a little bit. He doesn't quite know where Socrates is going with this. Callicles rejects the idea of self-discipline. He's still going, no, no, they, um, they don't need to be self-disciplined and they don't need to master the pleasures and desires. He doesn't like this because he wants an excuse to be able to act upon all of his pleasures, all of his desires. And so he responds by saying, no, 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 you're missing the point, Socrates. Human happiness is incompatible with enslavement to anyone. Okay. Human happiness, you can only be human if you are not restricted. You are not enslaved to anyone. And that includes, that anyone includes yourself. By this, Cocles means that mastery of oneself would be the same as being enslaved to oneself. He continues, the only authentic way of life is to do nothing to hinder or restrain the expansion of one's desires until they can grow no larger. This leads Socrates to challenge Callicles' position. Oh dear. There should be a, um, a possessive apostrophe on Callicles there. You better draw that into the little texta. This leads Socrates to challenge Callicles' position by offering what is known as the leaky jar analogy or argument. So, you probably paused there, had a break, went off, had a cup of tea, um, come back. I didn't actually go off and get a cup of tea. I've got my cold cup of tea that I started out with. Mmm, delicious. I hope you all appreciate the Harry Potter mug. Right, let's get back into it. There is a lot here. This video will inevitably be long. We'll attempt um, to break it up and probably make two or three little videos with it. Right, the leaky jar analogy. Socrates begins by asking, so the common idea 
that people who need nothing are happy is wrong. This assumes that there is a common idea that people who need nothing are happy. Which, I think it's fair to say that there is a common idea that people who need nothing are happy. They've got no... Um, they don't feel like they're missing out on something. They're not, uh, they're not aching for something. It leads to, of course, a whole range of both traditional and modern ideas of, you know, um, I'm trying to think what the current one is called, I think it's called, uh, I can't remember, maybe we'll just edit that bit out. Okay, the leaky jar analogy. Socrates begins by asking, so the common idea that people who need nothing are happy is wrong. To which Calicles says, yes, it's wrong. Claiming that otherwise there would be nothing happier than a corpse or a stone, because it has no need. At this point, Socrates recalls a story where the mind was likened to a jar. In the story, the part of the mind where desires are located is said to be, in the case of fools, leaky, so that fools are insatiable. Um... After asking if this analogy has convinced Callicles that self-discipline is better than self-indulgence, which it has not, Socrates expands upon this theme to offer his own version of the leaky jar analogy. Socrates basically says, there's two people. One has intact jars. These represent self-discipline i.e. jars that have a limit on who much, on how much they need to be filled. So I'm not assuming you're going to fix or not write down a note saying who much, but how much they need to be filled. One has leaky jars representing self-indulgence. There is no limit on them. In other words, they are not enslaved by anything. They are not. Um, they are free to expand. I.e., nothing to hinder or restrain the perpetual filling up expansion of these jars. In the case of the first man, when the jars are full, he can rest. In the case of the second man, he will have to continuously work to fill his jars, or his jars will be empty and he will suffer terribly. Therefore, the life of self-restraint is happier than the life of self-indulgence. That's what Socrates says. You can imagine Calicles listens to this story and it's like, I, don't, I just don't agree with this story. This is rubbish. But he doesn't quite know how to answer it. What Socrates is playing upon here is Socrates knows that Callicles is, as I said, an upper-class twit, someone who is wealthy and noble and has never worked a day in his life, someone who basically has servants who does everything for him. So by saying that self-indulgence requires constant work, um, this offends Callicles' idea of what is good upsets Callicles. Callicles is not convinced. He responds by saying that the one with the full jars can no longer feel pleasure. An enjoyable life consists in keeping as much pouring in as possible. So he, he avoids the, con the idea that the pouring in is work and focuses upon the idea that once it was full, um, you can no longer get any more. You can no longer feel pleasure. There's a, there's a real problem here. The two of them are using the analogy differently. So if we were to crit critique this analogy... Uh, first of all, you won't critique it in so, in so much as how effective was the 
analogy on Callicles. Well, it's not effective. It's not effective because they don't look at the analogy in the same way. From Socrates' point of view, the, the water or the liquid in the jar represents... Um, play, uh, represents pleasure and when the jar is full you have as much pleasure as you need you have pleasure um, from Callicles point of view it's actually the pouring in which is pleasure the water is sort of secondary so to speak it's not the pleasure it's the act of pouring which is the pleasure so if there's leaky jars you can continually pour which means that the act can continually happen which means you can continually have pleasure and from his Calicles point of view if you stop pouring i.e. because you're full you stop pleasure that means that the two of them are arguing at cross purpose You've probably had this sort of argument before where you realise that you're not on the same page. You're not using the terms in the same way as each other, in which case you're not going to end up with an agreement. Socrates, never one to just give up easily uh, and usually repeats himself um, as, as he was criticised before by Callicles, Callicles says, you keep saying the same thing again and again. So Socrates does. He says the same idea using a different metaphor. And here he uses an example um, of what, a gully bird. So Socrates says that this is like living like a gully bird. Now, the reference to gully bird is really obscure. It may refer to a bird that appears to see, sieve water through its mouth. Um, I've written, think of a penguin. Don't think of a penguin. It's not a penguin. I was thinking when I wrote that of a pelican. Pelicans that pick up water in their huge mouth and the water sort of sieves out, leaving the fish. Think of a penguin? Why would you think of a... If you want to think of a penguin, think of a penguin. I'm certain penguins are very nice. They look cute. But for the case of what we're talking about, think of a pelican. But we don't actually know that the, the phrase gully bird referred to a pelican or that sort of bird. Another um, theory is that the gully bird was a bird that eats and defecates at the same time. So come straight in and go straight out, like a leaky jar. Either way, the meaning is the same. The gully bird is one that cannot be satisfied. And this leads to Plato Gorgias Part 2.